In this video, we're going to take a look at some hyperbolic identities. And it turns out these uh, hyperbolic functions, even though they're not really trig functions, uh, they're not um, periodic and that sort of thing, they're defined in terms of e to the x and e to the minus x, turns out that they have a lot of identities which very closely resemble uh, a bunch of trig identities that we're already familiar with. So in this video, we're just going to go through uh, some of the more popular ones. Uh, I'm going to start off with some of the beginning ones, actually deriving them, but obviously that would take long to derive every one. So once I, I kind of get the idea of, across of how to derive them, uh, then I'll just give you the, the full list. So he, here's one, uh, and right off the bat, we see a, a similarity to our, our pre-cal classes and trig, trig functions and trig identities. Uh, trig identity that almost all of us know or are aware of is uh, for trig functions, sine squared uh, of an angle plus cosine squared of an angle always equals one. And that's one of the first identities that's taught in a pre-calc class. Well, for hyperbolic functions, they have the identity hyperbolic cosine squared minus hyperbolic sine squared equals one. Uh, so you'll see a similarity, but there are differences. This has to be a minus instead of a plus. Uh, but nevertheless, it's still very interesting that such a close relationship holds. So what I'll do for this first one is I'll, I'll actually derive it. I'll prove it. I'll show you that this really does equal one. And then for all the rest, then um, I'm just going to give you the list and you're welcome to, to prove them on your own. Okay, so the way a proof goes, if you've never seen one of these in, in like a pre-cal class or something like that, which hopefully you have, basically to prove something, you start with one side and then you try to logically work step by step by step by step, making clear, uh, clear steps that anybody could follow and end up with the other side. Okay, so you're not allowed, this is very important, you're not allowed to add things to both sides or subtract thing from, two things from both sides because we're not assuming that these are equal. We're trying to show that these are equal. So we're going to start with the left-hand side for this example and slowly work our way and see if we can mold this into the number one. So let's start with the left-hand side. Um, hyperbolic cosine squared minus hyperbolic sine squared. What can we do to possibly rewrite that? Because right now it's not clear that that equals one. Well, here's here's one thing that's a pretty, in my opinion, pretty clear we could do. Let's write it in terms of their basic definitions. This is e to the x plus e to the negative x all over two. And hyperbolic sine, oh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to square that. Okay, and then hyperbolic sine would be uh, e to the x minus e to the negative x all over two quantity squared. Okay, so that's the first thing we could do. Um, that still doesn't look anything like the number one. So let's see if there's some something else perhaps we could do. Let's, um, let's rewrite both of these guys who are squared, uh, possibly square the numerator and denominator so that we can drop, drop some of these parentheses. All right, so on this page, let's... Um, square the numerator and when you square the denominator that's obviously four two squared is four and let's also square this numerator we'll do the algebra in a second and that denominator will be the number four and they're being subtracted okay so i'm gonna whoops wrong way so i'm gonna subtract these two okay so what happens when i square this numerator well we'll need to uh, foil it first outer inner last as, as we well know so you get um, e to the x quantity squared. You get e to the x quantity squared. That would be e to the 2x. The, uh, the outer, and I'm not going to write down every detail of the algebra. Uh, the outer would be uh, e to the x times e to the negative x, which is e to the 0, which is 1. And the inner would be 1. So you get 1 and 1 makes uh, plus 2. And then for the last, you get e to the x, negative x times e to the negative x. That would make e to the negative 2x. So I didn't write down every detail. You might need to do that on your paper. But uh, basically, all I did was this numerator here. I just um, foiled it first, outer, inner, last. All right, uh, this numerator here would be e to the 2x 
the outer would be uh, one and the, I'm sorry, uh, let's see here, actually negative one, excuse me. The inner would be negative one, which would make a total of negative two. And the last would be e to the negative two x. So plus e to the negative two x, okay? So I foiled that, foiled that, squared the two, squared the two, everything looks good. Let's uh, combine these into one larger fraction. Let's see if I can actually draw a straight line. Well, it's not, <laughs> it's not great, but it'll work. All right, so um, let's combine these two. We have a common denominator of four. We have uh, e to the two x plus two plus e to the negative two x. And then for the second term here, don't forget that we're subtracting all of this. So we actually need to subtract all three of these terms. So let's be careful about that. So we'll get minus e to the two x. We'll get a plus two, because we have to change that sign because of this minus, and a minus e to the negative two x. Look carefully at the algebra. Uh, e to the two x minus e to the two x cancels. e to the negative two x minus e to the negative two x, that cancels. 2 and 2 make 4. 4 divided by 4 equals 1, which is the right-hand side, right? This is the right-hand side. So great for us. Um, what we did, and this is a very typical proof, was we started with the left-hand side and we ended with the right-hand side. Nobody told us it was the right-hand side. We morphed it or changed it into the right-hand side. And so this long string of equalities proves to any reader without a doubt that um, the left side does in fact e equal the right hand side and we proved that. So anyway, this would be labeled as kind of like your first big identity. So here we go with a list and you could prove every one I'm about to show you in a similar fashion, <clears throat> but obviously you can tell this would take a very long time if we did that like we just did for all the ones that are remaining. So anyway, here, here's a list. Um, hyperbolic cosine squared plus hyperbolic sine squared or uh, minus hyperbolic sine squared equals one. Um, hyperbolic tangent squared plus hyperbolic secant squared equals one. And it's not a coincidence. You, you'll notice a lot of similarities to some close relative uh, trig identities. These, there is a trig identity that has a tangent squared, a secant squared, and a one hyperbolic cotangent squared minus hyperbolic cosecant squared equals one. Again, there's a close trig identity relative to this one. Um, hyperbolic tan, uh, I'm sorry, hyperbolic sine squared equals negative one plus hyperbolic cosine of two X divided by two. There's a close trig relative to him. Hyperbolic cosine squared is one plus hyperbolic cosine of two X over two. For the trig identities, we called these guys the power reducing formulas because this has a power and this doesn't anymore. This has a, a lower power. We've reduced the power from two uh, to one. So you'll notice a, a strong similarity there to some, some well-known trig identities. Um, hyperbolic sine of two X equals two hyperbolic sine X times hyperbolic cosine of x. Uh, th this very closely resembles a trig identity uh, relative to, uh, to this guy. Um, hyperbolic cosine of 2x equals hyperbolic cosine squared plus hyperbolic sine squared of x. All right, and, and there's a few others. The six that I've listed are what I would call the uh, the main ones, the, the main hyperbolic identities that we should know. Now, let me mention something though. It kind of depends on who your teacher is or who your instructor is as to how strongly you need to know this. I'll be frank with you, I'll be honest. We don't use these guys near as often as we do the trig functions. Are they important? Yes, they're important. Like I mentioned before, we use these for engineering applications, physics applications, but um, they're not they're not as commonly used. So some uh, teachers or instructors may not require you to have memorized 
you know, all six of these or whatnot. Uh, some might just ask you either to prove them or, uh, or just simply to use them if they gave them to you on a test. So you need to clarify with your instructor uh, as far as what exactly you need to know. Um, and, there, and also as far as the other ones that I, that I haven't listed here, the, uh, when I say and others, there's uh, probably about six more sum and difference uh, formulas for hyperbolic sine and cosine. Uh, as far as my personal students, and I think this would be common among many instructors, um, I require my students to know these six and would be able to, should be able to recall these during a test if you needed them for anything, but I do not really require them to, uh, to memorize the and others, the other six sum and difference hyperbolic identities. But for the ones I've listed here, I would expect my students to know, you know, kind of know these on the fly. All right, so um, that's a little bit more that uh, we've shared now about hyperbolic functions. Um, notice nothing we've done up to this point has used any calculus. We haven't taken a derivative, we haven't taken an integral. So now we're gonna move on and kind of segue into the calculus type stuff and learn how to differentiate these guys and uh, kind of see what that has in store. So uh, you can go ahead and move on to those videos now.